Good day and welcome. My name is Max Edkins from the Connect for Climate program um, at the World Bank. We're coming to you live here from the Jeff Assembly in Vietnam, where we'll be talking about the global com commons over the next couple of days, what are the main challenges and how to overcome these with the solutions on the table. Um, so it's my great pleasure to have two panelists with me today. Thank you for joining me. So to my right, we've got uh, Margarita Astalaga. Thank you for joining us. Margarita is the Director of Environment, Climate, Gender and Social Inclusion Division, that's correct, yes. um, at the International Fund for Agriculture Development. And uh, further to my right, we've got uh, Roshan Koch. Koch. And Roshan is a Regional Climate Environmental Specialist for the Asia Pacific region, also uh, with the International Fund for Agriculture and Development, which is IFAD. Um, thank you so very much for joining us. So maybe just to get us going, um, Margarita, over to you. Could you explain a little bit about IFAD and, and what your main strategy and engagement is? Um, it is a fund for development. What exactly does that mean? Um, and then uh, could you also just highlight what your involvement here at the Jeff Assembly is and, and what are your main messages? Thank you for having us here. For us, um, our mandate is really to work with about 550 uh, Million fa billion families uh, that um, are concentrated in agriculture and small-scale fisheries. So our work is really to ensure that those uh, smallholders uh, not just uh, improve their livelihoods, but they reach the markets in a sustainable manner. So with all the threats that we are facing now with land degradation, environmental destruction and climate change, we have a big challenge ahead of us. Additionally, of course, we know that agriculture causes a lot of the problems we are facing right now on climate change, on land degradation, on water pollution. So what uh, we are really trying to do is making sure that um, we assist the small farmers getting out of that poverty but sustaining our planet for the future. Um, obviously, without food, there is no future for anybody. Uh, but it's the same without water or without soils. So for us, uh, the challenge is really to make sure that we support them to produce that food that uh, we need. So uh, the, um, our partnership with uh, the GF is a long-standing one. Since 2001, we have been working with the GF. And uh, thanks to that partnership, we are supporting about 24 countries around the world with about 32 projects, which really ensure that we tackle some of the key problems, environmental problems, and agriculture problems, and climate change issues, all together in a holistic manner. So we have uh, many examples of what we are doing around the world. And Roshan is, uh, of course, working for Asia Pacific. And one of the key areas we are working in in uh, Asia Pacific is started being funded by the GEF for us. And now we are moving to find other partners to work for us, with us, because this is a, a very important challenge. So maybe Roshan could also share with us that experience that we have working with pitlands in this region. Absolutely. So uh, you're really an international organization helping um, enhance the natural resource base, which so many of our people are reliant on. So really enhancing the soils and, and ensuring you know, that we have a holistic and sustainable food production as well as a marine environment. So Roshan, um, maybe you could dive a bit deeper into the experiences from the region and, and tell us a little bit about the, the peatland project as an example. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, so IFAD has been working on, on peatlands in Southeast Asia, that's Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and the other ASEAN uh, countries. And we started off in 2009 with a Jeff uh, grant of four and a half million. Um, uh, it was a regional project. But since then, we've, we've really you know, ramped up and we're, we're moving into a, a, a much larger programmatic approach. But before I get to that, the peatlands are um, ancient, uh, uh, vast reservoirs of, of organic matter that have accumulated over many hundreds of years. So in Southeast Asia, they have some of the largest you know, tropical uh, peatland, uh, peat areas. So this is a vast reservoir of carbon. And over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been an increasing um, uh, effort at, at uh, well, 
deforestation and and establishment of large scale plantations which has led to all kinds of uh, uh, um, challenges. Uh, one of the big challenges is that they use fire for land clearance and because of that there's this huge haze uh, problem uh, that happens on an annual basis. It's one of the largest, you know, um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. It's a massive loading of greenhouse gas emissions. So we're working with the ASEAN uh, Secretariat uh, as a regional body, and we're working with a number of uh, technical partners, the Global Environment Center, uh, and other um, bilateral and multilateral partners like the EU and GIZ uh, to really focus attention on, on addressing this in, in a comprehensive way. Um, if I can go a little bit into the detail of this, Absolutely. what we're looking at, at at the national level is we're looking at, first of all, inventorizing all of the peat areas because this is, you need to know where the peat is before you can, you know, actually respond to it. And um, many of the countries have realized the challenge and now they're putting in place, you know, very good policies and, and, and uh, technical approaches to address this. So, for example, in Indonesia, they've passed a regulation where peat area has to be managed using a peatland hydrogeologic unit approach. Now this is an extremely important, uh, 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 let's say, paradigm shift. Um, and so we're working with the government to actually operationalize that on the ground. How do you manage peat by managing the hydrogeologic unit? How do you bring in all the different stakeholders together and, and coming up with an integrated management plan that looks at, you know, uh, using peatlands in a sustainable way, protecting other areas, and, and, and maintaining the entire hydrogeologic you know, functioning. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we're, we're working on. Absolutely. So, I mean, you, you really highlighted the value of peatlands and, and, and the natural capital uh, that, that they, uh, they contribute. Um, and their degradation, it, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, is associated with local air pollution, but also to the uh, greenhouse gases that are contributing to climate change. So looking ahead, how, how are you working in the region to really um, enhance the preservation and also the, the spread and, and, and uh, in enhanced, uh, you know, uh, functioning of peatlands to ensure that carbon is also absorbed through these uh, ecosystems? Right. So, um, so our first line of, let's say, action is to conserve the existing peat areas that, have, that haven't been disturbed. And this requires, you know, uh, a process of demarcating them and ensuring that there's proper, you know, management of those and, and no encroachment into that. The second line is to, uh, to restore those areas that have been degraded. Um, and this, there are vast areas, and so we need to uh, improve the hydrogeologic functioning to raise the water levels and then allow you know natural regeneration to take place uh, or if there if there's a need enhance planting and then the third area is where you have actual production systems a lot of investments have gone in there's a lot of capital sunken capital in there how do you use those areas in a sustainable way how do you minimize you know greenhouse gas emissions how do you use, how do you allow you know smallholder farmers to be able to survive off of those lands without doing further damage and and that's very much uh, the role of ifad in general it's it's to enhance the um, natural uh, s cycle and ecological systems around agriculture and uh, around other natural resource uh, processes for smallholders. So, so maybe looking ahead, what are your aims um, in, in terms of working with smallholders and uh, enhancing the, the eco-functioning of those uh, landscape processes? Well, um, our priority now is really to work with a food systems approach. And it means we are concentrating our efforts in uh, looking at uh, the ecosystems with a landscape approach making sure that we are looking at better ways of doing agriculture. So we are working towards uh, multi-cropping, agroforestry, um, but not only in, in these manners of doing better agriculture, but also assessing ecosystem services through community-based approaches. Because for us, um, the communities, the rural communities are the most vulnerable communities anywhere in the world. They are really affected by climate change, and but, but by every shock, but every tsunami, every flood, 
they are the ones that have to face those problems. So that's why uh, we are working uh, from a lens of social inclusion. And in that social inclusion aspect, we include women, and that's why we are delighted that the council has approved the new gender strategy. Um, we are also working with the youth, because for agriculture, uh, right now we see the challenge we have, that in average worldwide, uh, the average age is 60. So, and we are talking about the need to increase food production by 60% or 70%, depending on who is counting. But who is going to produce the food if we don't get the youth interested in working in the rural areas? So that is part of our uh, challenge now is, on the one hand, ensure that we empower women because uh, when we empower women, when women have access to the assets, uh, children have better nutrition. They have better education. Um, women tend to save more. And that means that their quality of life of the family and the community improves sustainably. And also in uh, developing some innovations to attract the youth to come or stay. Some are returning. But you have to offer different type of agriculture. They will not go back to what their parents were doing because the parents work very hard to take them through university, through college, and now they want to do agriculture in a different manner. So that is what we have to look at and how to, to ensure that it's going to be an attractive area of work for this uh, huge amount of youth around the world in some regions is 60% of the population. So. That is, uh, I think, our challenge, but um, we know we can do it. So, so I mean, it, it's really a holistic development approach that you're applying there to enhance uh, the, the agricultural production and, 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 and include uh, societal needs. Um, maybe some of those examples of how do you attract young people, how, how do you ensure that, you know, modern agriculture, future agriculture, uh, integrates renewable energy, has a, a holistic biodiversity and, and conservation approach, and is something exciting that, you know, one people, uh, younger, the younger generation wants to be a part of to build this more sustainable future. No, absolutely. I think you, you put your finger right on it, because this, this goes to, to the issue of values, and how do we, you know, um, how do we engage youth in terms of looking at you know what, what is meaningful for them, right? And and how how do we help them realize you know their aspirations within their value system? So I think we've in the in the past been um, let's say we've, we've we've had this approach of you know uh, 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 kind of transferring the prairie agricultural model, you know, all over the world where we're looking at, you know, large scale monocropping, industrialized farming, and we have to make that shift to a more, you know, agroecological system. And I think in the tropics or, you know, in the, in the, in the countries that we work in, the developing countries, the, 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 there's been a historical, you know, process of multi-cropping and, 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 and a conservation of agri-biodiversity and all of that. So it's a matter of bringing those back in and valorizing them, for a, lack of a better word, uh, so that the youth feel that, okay, this is, they, they are contributing to something greater than their own, you know, uh, let's say livelihoods that they're that the work that they're doing is actually contributing to improving the environment contributing to global you know benefits and so on so for that there are a number of changes that have to happen because uh, we know not very many people are interested in you know hard labor so how do we support them in you know reducing that drudgery, drudgery associated with farming so how do we you know bring in appropriate technologies to help them out as you mentioned, renewable energy. How do we, you know, integrate renewable energy into that process so that, you know, they have access to also some of the modern, you know, amenities, right? Whether it is refrigeration, whether it is ac access to the internet, and, and so on and so forth. So all of that needs to be brought into the new, you know, uh, approach to to, to uh, engaging youth. Yeah. So it's, it's bringing the new technologies, the clean technologies, and combining them with an agroecological approach. So maybe just in closing, uh, we are on, on Facebook Live here, so maybe your message for young people out there to be a part of this uh, revolution to a more sustainable future, this uh, drive to conserve our global commons. Well, um, I would say that they have to become the leaders 
of uh, the change of the planet because it's for their future. It's our past almost and it's their children that will have to live with whatever we, the planet they find. So we have done our work <laughs> very hard, but we need now the youth to be really active and make their uh, decision makers accountable for their future. That's, I think, the main message. <laughs> Perfect. And a quick soundbite from you? Well, I, I think Margarita has said it. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, they need to uh, not, uh, we have to help them take that leadership role. We need to also, in a way, step aside and, and give them the space to be able to take that role and to be able to lead in that, in that process. So I think that's, that's our job. So, so the young people are already leaders of today, and we just have to ensure that they get the space to lead. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. Um, and thank you for joining us on Facebook Live here at the Jeff Assembly. Um, keep en engaging with us, with us with the hashtag Jeff Live. Um, broadcasting on the Connect for Climate channel. Thank you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you.